So I will indeed be presenting a theory of conceptual change, particularly moral conceptual change. And I have three um, key questions uh, that I want to answer in order to construct such a theory. So I would first want to know what kinds of changes can occur in moral concepts over time. So how can moral concepts change over time? So I will spend a lot of time um, on that particular question. I will also spend some time on the question what causes these ch changes, right? So there's a description of the changes itself and then a description of the, an explanation of the causes of these changes. And as a particular topic within this context of talking about moral conceptual change, I want to investigate, um, how, uh, well, uh, two uh, developments, which are the emergence of new moral concepts and the obsolescence of moral concepts that are being discarded. So most of my talk will be about uh, change within existing moral concepts, but then I will also spend some time on the emergence of new moral concepts and their obsolescence. Okay, so um, I want to start with a discussion of the structure of moral concepts. And the reason I spent uh, time on this is because I believe that if you look at existing theories of um, conceptual change and spe specifically moral conceptual change, there isn't uh, often a lot of attention to the way in that moral concepts are structured. And I think that's important to have such a theory of the structure of moral concepts, because then you can see how different structural elements within moral concepts can actually undergo change while the others may remain constant. So that leads to uh, conceptions of different uh, types of uh, moral conceptual change, depending on different structural elements of moral concepts changing. So we'll start, start with a uh, theory of that. So first of all, I start with a somewhat familiar distinction, the distinction between thick and thin moral concepts where thin moral concepts are moral concepts that only have evaluative content or normative content, uh, and thick moral concepts are those that have both evaluative and descriptive content. So what does that mean in practice? Uh, well, you have concepts like good, bad, right, ought, and duty that um, they don't really describe anything about the world. They just um, give an evaluative or normative um, assessment. So they say something, to, to say that something is good doesn't describe anything about it, it just evaluates, it just um, gives a evaluative judgment. Whereas in thick moral concepts, we have evaluative content, um, but we also have descriptive content. So these concepts, they refer to conditions in the world that must be a certain way for the concept to apply, right? So if you have a concept of privacy, for example, it describes particular conditions to which that concept applies, conditions in which people have solitude or in which they're not intruded on, however you want to describe it. They are particular conditions in the world um, that satisfy the conditions of the concept of privacy. And the same goes for these other uh, moral concepts. So they describe a certain conditions of the world as well as evaluating uh, these conditions as being good or desirable or a right or a duty. Okay, so that's one distinction between thick and thin moral concepts and evaluative and descriptive content within uh, concepts, moral concepts. Going on, um, uh, so that's what I just said. So going on uh, about thick moral concepts. So thick moral concepts then um, have a descriptive and evaluative component. Let's go into a bit more detail what that means. 
So the descriptive component of a thick moral concept describes an abstract condition or state of affairs in the world that is considered good or desirable. So for example, privacy describes a condition in which individuals or groups are able to seclude themselves or information about themselves from others. And that condition is then considered good. It is even considered to be a right in many societies. So that's what makes it a moral concept uh, in combining that abstract condition, which is descriptive, with an evaluative content, which is that it is good or that it is a right. Similarly, we have negative liberty, uh, which can be defined as the absence of interference, co coercion or restraint by others. So that is a particular condition in the world that is being described but it's a desirable condition, it's a good condition, and, and therefore it is a, a moral concept. Um, the, again, combining this uh, description of an abstract condition with an evaluative, evaluative content, which expresses its goodness uh, or its, um, it being a right or, or, or a duty. So uh, the evaluative com component then of a thick moral concept assigns an evaluative status to the descriptive content. Um, for example, autonomy is good, privacy is right, cruelty is evil. So let's move on to further distinction between within the descriptive descriptive component of thick moral concepts, we can make a further distinction of the predicate uh, and the arguments. So um, we already saw examples of the descriptive content of several thick moral concepts. Within that descriptive content, you can usually um, distinguish a predicate, which is the property relation or action described by the concept and arguments, which are entities that take on particular roles in the state of affairs expressed uh, through that predicate. So for example, uh, in the concept of privacy, the predicate is this ability to, seclu to seclusion or information of information or, or oneself. And the arguments uh, are the, there's a reference to a moral patient, that is the person who has privacy and a moral agent uh, or moral agents, those who could, um, um, the others mentioned in the predicate who could uh, frustrate this ability to seclude oneself. And the arguments in these moral concepts, they are sometimes implicit. Um, uh, so there's often an implicit reference to those um, uh, arguments. Um, but, and sometimes um, moral concepts, they have a reference to only to a moral patient, sometimes only to a moral agent, and sometimes to both. So to give you a couple of examples that describe that in more detail, so we have privacy as a thick moral concept. It has um, an evaluative component, which is that uh, privacy is morally good and even that it is a right, a human right. Uh, it has a descriptive component, which consists of a predicate, which is something along the lines of the ability to seclude oneself or information of oneself to others. It has a moral patient, which is the recipient of privacy and a moral agent, those who may intrude on privacy. Uh, or a second example, we have courage, which is also a thick moral concept, and it's, a, it's actually a virtue concept. Uh, the evaluative component here is that courage is morally good. Uh, this descriptive component has a predicate, which is that courage is a willingness to face negative situations involving danger or pain. So that's a descriptive situation uh, described by this notion of uh, courage. 
And courage comes with a moral agent, who, the person who is willing to be courageous, who is willing to face negative situations involving danger or pain. In this case, there is no real moral patient. That is, um, courage is not a relational moral concept uh, or, or relational virtue, as some virtues are. So there is no moral patient in this case. Then uh, a final distinction in our theory of the structure of moral concepts, which is the notion of conceptual matrix. So, so far, I've been assuming that um, concepts have fixed meanings, which then consist of uh, a, a normative part uh, or evaluative part, a descriptive part, which then has the predicates and arguments. However, um, as you may know, moral concepts often have different interpretations uh, or there are different conceptions, different theories of what um, justice is, what freedom is, etc., etc. So that for that reason, we need the notion of conceptual matrix, which is uh, expresses this idea that there are these different interpretations of uh moral concepts and what what does a different interpretation mean well that means that it is being related semantically to different sets of concepts with different conceptual relations in terms of which this uh, moral concept is to be understood right so the meaning of the moral concept um, can be construed differently with expressing it in terms of other sets of concepts um, so typically there are multiple conceptual matrices for moral concepts that also tend to correspond to different theories of that concept um, and some of these conceptual matrices may be more dominant others more um, peripheral so, for example, as you know, we have different conceptions of justice, different conceptions of privacy, and other moral concepts as well. So, again, to illustrate with the notion of privacy here, we have at least four uh, theories of privacy that define privacy differently. The non-intrusion theory, uh, privacy being the ability to be free of intrusions, seclusion theory, control theory, limitation theory. So they all re relate privacy to a different set of concepts, some making reference to intrusions, other to seclusion, other to control and access, et cetera, um, thereby presenting different conceptual matrices to understand the notion of privacy. So there may be something underlying and common to all of these because they refer to similar intuitions uh, of how the notion of privacy applies to specific conditions and how it should be applied, but they will um, they have a somewhat different semantics and therefore also leading to different application conditions of the concept of privacy. So um, this then. Uh, okay, this one is the one I should have. This then leads to a theory of moral conceptual change. Having understood uh, how moral concepts are structured, we can now understand how, in what ways moral conceptual change can occur. And what we can see is that all these different elements that I just distinguished can change separately from each other in different ways. So let's start with uh, how that works for uh, changes in descriptive content. Uh, first of all, descriptive content within a conceptual matrix. So we already have a particular interpretation of the meaning of a moral concept. And we're here concerned with um, how the descriptive content of that concept can change. And as we have seen, that can happen in two ways, through um, changes in the predicate, because 
they all have a predicate, and then there could be changes in the arguments. So first of all, changes in the predicate, predicate modifications uh, involve expansions, contractions, or modifications of the predicate. For example, um, we have already seen the predicate of the concept of privacy, which refers to this um, conditions condition in which individuals or groups are able to seclude themselves or information about themselves from others. Well, we can conceive of a situation uh, early on in the definition of privacy where uh, privacy was mainly about um, the seclusion of individuals, right? So that's how at the end of the 19th century, Warren and Brandeis defined privacy, that it's um, about seclusion of individuals from others. But we have seen over history that information was considered more and more important as well in understanding privacy, that personal information is also a central notion, uh, not just the access of others to oneself, but also the access of others to personal information about oneself. So you can conceive of a modification of the concept of privacy by inserting this notion of information into the privacy concept, into the predicate that uh, is uh, that defines uh, privacy. So that's uh, predicate modification. Argument modification means that variables or arguments are added or subtracted or that their definition and scope is altered especially the alterations in definition and scope of the arguments is something that frequently happens and then usually it's an either an expansion or contraction of the class of moral agents or an expansion or construction of the class of moral patients so with the first moral agents um, this is um, the expansion of the moral concepts to include moral agents that weren't included before for example some people want to um, make certain moral concepts applicable to robots and artificial agents more generally as um, conceived of as moral agents right so they are um uh so co moral concepts like virtues can be, be uh, related to them or moral responsibility of course uh, at a certain point when organizations and institutions were formed it was also uh, concluded that moral agency can apply to organizations that they can have moral responsibility or have virtues uh, we can also see expansion or contraction of the class of moral patients, and especially uh, expansion has taken place over the course of history, where um, sometimes uh, moral patienthood uh, was uh, limited to uh, very selected uh, classes of human beings, and that has expanded over time. So, um, uh, for example, from men to also include women, from whites to also include non-whites, uh, ex expansion to, to animals, to fetuses, ecosystems, etc. They they can they are all assigned rights or moral statuses, and thereby you expand um, the application conditions of uh, moral concepts. So then there's uh, something that also sometimes happens with moral concepts is that uh, moral concepts often have subcategories. Um, so subcategories, uh, they um, it's, it's like the genus species, species relation, right? So you have justice, but you also have specific types of justice, like distributive, uh, retributive, and restorative justice. And you have privacy in general, but then you also have bodily privacy, informational privacy, relational privacy, spatial privacy, etc. And these notions can be very useful. So they're they're more like subconcepts rather than the concept itself. But uh, you can still see the addition 
of such a subcategory as a, as a specific type of uh, moral conceptual change that is it introduces new um, moral subcategories. And so the addition or the modification or addition or uh, changes in prominence of these subcategories, I also count as a type of moral conceptual change, although not as groundbreaking or not as important maybe as the, the previous uh, types of moral change, because these apply to the whole concept, not just to the subcategory. So then let's look, look at a moral conceptual change across conceptual matrices. So what we're looking at here is two things. Um, so what, what we usually what we see often with moral concepts is that there are multiple competing interpretations, which I describe as competing conceptual matrices. And sometimes one of those is more dominant, or one or two of them are more dominant, and then others are, are less uh, dominant. So what's possible over time is that um, there's an arrangement, rearrangement uh, within this set of conceptual matrices so that some become more prominent than others, so that the, the more prominent conceptual matrices become less prominent and less, a less prominent conceptual matrix becomes more prominent or more accepted, I should say, as well. And so there have always been different interpretations, for example, of the notion of justice. But historically, and this goes over centuries, you can see that um, the dominant notion of justice would uh, dominant notions of justice tended to define it um, in more hierarchical terms. So that means that what's just in relation to one person is not the same what, as what's just for another person because they are at different locations in the hierarchy. That has kind of has shifted to more egalitarian conceptions of um, uh, justice in the modern age, and then more recently also to more welfareist conceptions of justice. So shifts in the conceptual matrix, uh, rearrangements of prominence of conceptual matrices. And that also includes the introduction of completely new conceptual matrices. Uh, so for example, I would claim that um, in the 20th century, the um, prevailing conceptions of well-being were at the time the, the more uh, perfectionist and objective list accounts as well as uh, hedonist accounts. In the 20th century, you see the introduction of desire satisfactionist accounts of uh, well-being. So a new conceptual matrix is introduced that relates well-being to the satisfaction of desires. So then we have uh, also uh, changes in evaluative content of moral concepts. So, so far, I've only been talking about changes in the descriptive content. Changes in eval evaluative content, uh, most importantly, include changes in moral status. Um, that is, um, in thick moral concepts, um, new moral statuses can be assigned or moral statuses can be abandoned. Um, so privacy, before it became a moral concept, was actually a non-moral concept, which simply described a certain secluded state. And then uh, in the modern times, modern times, people started considering that to be a morally good state or even a right. And at the end of the 19th century, it became a right. So it's a change in moral status. It's the assignment of new uh, evaluative content to a, a descriptive concept and thereby elevating its, its moral status. And in the same way, you can also downgrade the moral status uh, as well. And um, there's also 
and I don't have an expanded theory of this. There's also the fact that thin moral con new thin moral concepts can be introduced, uh, moral concepts can be modified or abandoned. Uh, for example, the whole notion of a human right was also historically introduced at a certain point in time as, I think, a new um, thin moral concept. All right, so let's put that into a picture. So we have moral conceptual change, which uh, can consist of changes in descriptive or evaluative content, where changes in evaluative content can be understood as changes in moral status of uh, moral concepts, especially of thick moral concepts. Um, changes in descriptive content can occur within a conceptual matrix or across conceptual matrices. Within a conceptual matrix, it's either predicate modification or variable or argument modification or subcategory modification. And across conceptual matrices, it's either the arrange rearrangement, uh, changes in prominence of existing conceptual matrices or the introduction of new conceptual matrices. That's a theory of um, moral conceptual change in terms of what types of change there are. I haven't really spoken too much yet about what can cause these changes. So let's now talk about causes of moral conceptual change. And this is something I still need to develop more. But um, for each of these changes, uh, we can look at various causes and sometimes the causes are more um, having to do with new knowledge or changing uh, empirical conditions. Sometimes they result more from new uh, theoretical insights or improvements. Sometimes they result from broader changes in morality. So if you look at predicate modification, um, Predicate modification can result from changes in our empirical reality or our knowledge of empirical reality that necess necessitate changes in the descriptive conditions of the predicate. For example, what we have seen in the concept of privacy is that privacy, privacy was in, in the 19th century, it was mostly concept expressive of physical conditions. Um, and it has now almost entirely become an informational concept, the informational concept of privacy, because most privacy issues occur in the digital informational realm. Um, a second way in which predicate modification can occur is because of conceptual improvements to better capture our moral intuitions, uh, or it could result from broader changes in morality, now, in a similar way, argument modification um, it can result, first of all, from the assignment of enhanced moral worth to moral patients, uh, such as non-whites or ecosystems or other moral patients that are kind of morally upgraded in the moral system. Um, it can also result from the emergence of new moral agents or patients that must be given a place in the moral order such as organizations or robots, or they can result from new insights about the abilities and intentions of candidate moral agents, also like animals or robots. Subcategory modif modification results from the creation or discovery of new application domains for a concept that, requirements th that require development of a sub-concept, sub then um, new or changed conceptual matrices can result from changes in empirical reality or knowledge, uh, from new theoretical Was that iterations. The Sorry? Uh, yes. Hello? Do we have to reconsider our plans? Um, uh, or broader changes in morality. And then changes in moral status, um, in evaluative status, often result from broader changes in morality 
that suggest changes changes in a conceptual matrix. Okay, finally, my final section. So what I've done so far is I've introduced um, a theory of the structure of moral concepts, how those moral concepts can change over time, uh, kind of referring to these different structural elements that can change what, and what the causes can be of those changes. I here want to pay specific attention to what this means for the introduction of new moral concepts and the complete abandonment of moral concepts, because so far I've been focusing more on changes within existing moral concepts. I want to say a bit more about introduction and abandonment of moral concepts. So starting with the introduction of moral concepts, I'd like to distinguish between two types of the introduction of moral concepts. Um, so a moral concept can either be uh, introduced as a result of the upgrading of a non-moral concept to a moral concept by through the assignment of moral status. So, so really what happens there is that there is a descriptive condition that already is ha has expression in an existing concept. And that descriptive condition uh, is now recognized as morally good or even a right or a duty or something else. So I think that historically, if you look at the concept of privacy, it has been upgraded from, from a condition to an ideal or morally good condition and even as a moral right. Another way in which a new moral concept can emerge is when it's really brand new, both the normative status and the descriptive component are new. This is when a new moral concept is crafted with a new descriptive component that expresses an ideal condition that has not been recognized so far as a potentially desirable condition. So possible candidate here would be the concept of sustainability. So there, there are some precursors of this notion. So you could also say it's an upgrading of a non-moral concept, uh, but I think the precursors are so different and kind of have had more limited usage than the concept of privacy had uh, in say the 18th or 17th century, that it's perhaps better to say that sustainability is a brand new concept that was introduced in the second half of the 20th century um, to express uh, a new type of desirable situation um, that should be part of our moral vocabulary. Finally, uh, what is the abandonment of moral concepts and how does it happen? Well, uh, here in symmetry with the introduction of moral concepts, um, we have two ways in which this may happen. Uh, first is the downgrading of a moral concept to a non-moral concept. So privacy at one point was upgraded from a non-moral to a moral con uh, concept. It's conceivable that in the future, people, people think, oh, my, my privacy is not that important. Uh, it it's, has become a tradable good. So perhaps it's not so morally desirable or it shouldn't be considered a right. And if that point comes, then we have basically downgraded privacy again from a moral to a non-moral concept. Uh, and a second, uh, option is the complete abandonment of a um, moral concept. So that these are situations in which also the descriptive component of the concept is not considered to be particularly useful anymore, maybe because of changes in empirical reality or conditions, so that the whole concept is abandoned. So what are possible causes of such abandonment of moral concepts? Well, I see three. The first is that there can be a loss of applicability of the descriptive component of a moral concept. So for example, chival chivalry um, is a particular virtue 
that presupposes the existence of a particular system of social organization that at a certain point uh, ceased to be. And then that whole notion uh, really cannot rely on this descriptive component anymore, which refers to that system of social organization. So then the whole notion of chivalry pretty much has to be abandoned. Another possibility is that um, there is a loss of instrumental moral value. So um, certain moral concepts are instrumentally valuable because they um, refer to, because they are a means to achieve other uh, moral principles or social uh, social or moral values. So for example, chastity used to be uh, an influential virtue, but chastity was had an instrumental moral role, which was uh, to, uh, to uh, help uh, men and women avoid pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy, uh, pregnancy out of wedlock, um, uh, amongst others, um, due to sexual activity. But at the moment where uh, pregnancy can be prevented through the use of contraceptives, that instrumental moral value uh, is largely lost. And for that reason, that's, I think, part of the reason why the concept of um, chastity has become virtually obsolete. And finally, uh, abandonment of moral concepts can also result from borrowed changes in morality. So I think, for example, chastity, there, there was already an occurring shift, secularization, and then together with these contraceptives resulted in the abandonment, the virtual abandonment of that moral concept. So to conclude, I've presented you with theory of moral conceptual change. Uh, predicated on a theory of the structure of moral concepts, which has led me to uh, identify different ways in which moral concepts can change. I have identified potential causes of such changes, and I have singled out specifically uh, how new moral concepts can be uh, born and how moral concepts are abandoned. And that's it. Thank you very much.